Colin, introduction. This is LLC planning for rental properties, part two. We've already done part one and did some introductory material. So now we're going to get to uh, what I think a lot of people are really interested in, which is how an LLC can protect your rental properties from seizure in a lawsuit. So we're really hit the meat of what a lot of people think of when they think of LLCs tonight. So just a little bit of housekeeping here. Please feel free to submit your questions via the chat or message function in Zoom. I've already got a message in the chat. I think you should be able to press a button to pull up the chat menu and then be able to ask me any questions you want during the presentation. That'll really help me get an idea of whether I'm doing a good job of explaining things and trying to be helpful to you guys. We are recording this presentation so you can see it again or share it with anyone who might be interested in it. I'm also going to ask that you please mute your microphones uh, just in case because we might get a lot of background noise and it might be hard to hear the presentation through that. Mandatory disclaimers. This presentation does not create an attorney-client privilege, and that's really because this presentation is general in nature, and we can't cover every exception that's going to apply to your, your case. Uh, we're just trying to be helpful here, but for if you want to talk to an attorney with your specific case, please feel free to shoot an email to our firm at, you might already have it already, info at tcvlaw.com, or call us at Here's our contact info on this page right here, 512-263-5400. Just a little bit about our law firm, if you don't know about us yet. Uh, what we're really good at is three things, I think. Estate planning, that's like wills and trusts and planning for what happens to your assets. Protecting your assets, which is what we're talking about tonight with LLCs, and then trust, estate, and probate administration. How do you carry out? a will or a trust uh, after you've gotten written and it's time to do what it tells you to do. So that's kind of what we do at our law firm here. So without further ado, here's what we covered in the last presentation in part one. You know, how an LLC, how owning a rental property in, an, in your name is different from owning it in, a, in an LLC. And then some of the mechanics of an LLC, you know, how to set one up, how to sign for loans, how to close on real estate in an LLC. But now we're gonna talk about, I think, uh, the meat of the issue, which is, you know, how does an LLC shield your assets from seizure or lawsuits? And then what are the exceptions to the LLC protection? We'll talk about veil piercing. And also something a lot of people ask about is, what is a series LLC? How can it hold multiple rental properties and how can it shield each separate rental property while having just one entity, which really cuts down on filing costs and lawyer costs uh, when you want to have multiple rental properties, but want to reduce kind of the paperwork that you've got. So hopefully we'll get there tonight too. So I'm going to go on and jump ahead to asset protection with LLCs. Okay, so that's where we are right here. Here's kind of our big roadmap, and we're kind of here in the middle. How LLCs shield your assets from creditors, and then the next part will be the exception to that asset protection, which is called veil piercing here in the state of Texas. So when we talk about asset protection, let's talk about the asset protection you just get automatically by being a resident of the state of Texas, because that's kind of our baseline level of protection. So in Texas, by default, your wages from work are shielded from garnishment. So that makes Texas very friendly. You know, there is an exception. I think the, the major exception that comes to mind is child support payments. But otherwise, your wages are exempt from seizure. Another big protection under the Texas Property Code are retirement accounts. So things like your 401k, your traditional IRA, your Roth IRA, those accounts by default protected from seizure in the state of Texas. Texas also gives you a pretty generous level of protection for your personal assets, like home furnishings and your car. The big one in Texas that a lot of states don't have. A lot of states will give you a homestead protection, 
but they'll put some sort of cap on it, like a value cap, maybe $50,000. Texas doesn't do it that way. Texas says, you know what? You know, there's an acreage limitation, you know, so if your homestead is really big, then you may not get the whole homestead protected. But otherwise, it can grow in, into a huge amount of value and it's protected. But always there's an exception. And in our case, we definitely have an exception. Our rental property is protected from seizure by default under the Texas Property Code. No. Cash and cash in your checking or savings accounts? No. Investments outside of your retirement accounts. That would be, for example, you've got a 401k, but you've also got a normal brokerage account that you know has Exxon Mobil shares, Apple shares. If that's not a retirement account like a 401k or an IRA, that is subject to seizure. So those kind of assets are the assets we want to protect. Tonight, we're talking about rental properties. So let's do some examples. So we got some concrete examples, okay? So let's say we've got a client and that client has been sued. That client has a rental property that's not in an LLC. Which of the following assets can be seized? So I'm going to put the question to you guys. Give me an answer in chat. I really want to know what you guys think. The client has cash in a personal checking account. In a personal checking account. Can that cash be seized in a lawsuit? Can that cash be seized in a lawsuit? Any takers, any brave takers? No. In this case, the, the cash in the personal checking account can definitely be seized, right? Because it's not subject to the normal protections under the Texas Estates Code. What about the homestead? Can the homestead property be seized in a lawsuit? No. The homestead property is protected from seizure under the Texas Estates Code. What about mutual funds in a 401k plan? Can a creditor reach your mutual funds that are inside a 401k plan? I see one answer, no. Any other brave souls? No, Hunter, you're exactly right, no. Because the mutual funds are in a 401k plan, Texas comes out and says, nope, the retirement accounts are, are typically protected from seizure. What about mutual funds in a personal account? Mutual funds in a non-retirement account. Can those be seized in a lawsuit in Texas by a typical creditor? Yes. So the mutual funds in a personal account, because they're not in a retirement account, can definitely be seized. They are exposed to seizure in a lawsuit. And then lastly, and this is what I think a lot of us are here for, is what if the client owns rental property in his or her individual name? His or her individual name. Can that rental property be seized by a creditor? Can that rental property that's in that person's individual name be seized? I see a yes. Any other answers? Any other answers? I see another yes. Yes, you guys are both right. Absolutely, that is correct. So that's why we're talking about LLCs tonight because we're worried if we own a rental property, how can we keep it protected from being seized from us in a lawsuit? So, oh geez, here we go. Next slide. So a common question is, but wait a second, Chris, what about landlord's insurance? I mean, typically when I own a rental property, I have landlord's insurance. Doesn't that protect me 
from having my rental property seized from me. And so I'm always going to tell you, yes, I think landlord insurance is a very good idea. And in addition, if you've got a mortgage on the rental property, you probably are required to have landlord insurance anyway. But, you know, let's take a quick look at some of the common coverages. On this left side of the screen here, you've got common coverages, right? So typically you have dwelling coverage. So that's the property, right? The building. But, you know, that has exclusions, right? It's not going to cover you for flooding. It's typically got deductibles. For business liability, it's not a perfect shield because take a look over here. Punitive damages and damages related to the violation of law. So if the person suing you establishes punitive damages or says, you know what, the reason I'm suing you is because you broke the law and you caused me harm because of that, your landlord's insurance is not going to cover you for that. And then medical payments to other, that's a common coverage on landlord's insurance. You know, there are limitations in amount. And here's the one that really can come back and bite you. And we'll see that in an example. The injury has to occur at the rental property location. And that's not always the situation where the injury occurred. But I know that's a little abstract. Let's do an example. Example one. Dave is sued for professional malpractice unrelated to his rental property. Unrelated to his rental property. He gets sued and there's a judgment against him. Is this lawsuit for medical malpractice covered by Dave's landlord policy? Is this lawsuit covered by Dave's landlord policy? What do you guys think? Any brave answers there? I see a no. That's exactly right. Because this lawsuit has nothing to do with the rental property. It's for malpractice, right? So in this case, even though you did the right thing and you had landlord insurance on your property, it doesn't cover this kind of lawsuit. So you're not protected in this case. Let's look at another case. Dave gets into a car accident. He sued for lost wages. Is this lawsuit covered by Dave's landlord policy? Car accident, sued for lost wages. Is this lawsuit covered by Dave's landlord policy? What do you guys think? I see another no. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because remember, just like the medical malpractice case, this lawsuit is not, has nothing to do with the rental property, right? So in this case, the landlord insurance does not protect you in this case. So for a lot of our doctors, our doctors are the common example in this case, they get sued for medical malpractice. Or if you're on the board of directors and you get sued for breach of fiduciary duty, the landlord insurance is not gonna cover, protect your rental property in this case. So you might want an additional layer of protection and that's where the LLC comes in. So let's take a look at that. So remember what we've been talking about here is the standard layer of protection that you've got. You've got landlord insurance, you get a security deposit, you, sc you screen your tenants with a background check. That's the normal layer of protection. We always definitely want that. But what an LLC does is it adds a second layer of protection for you. First of all, if you've got a separate LLC, Texas literally looks at the LLC and says, that is its own separate entity. It is separate from you. It is separate from you. So what does that mean for us, though? That means that if the LLC has a liability, those liabilities don't affect your personal assets. They're separate from your personal assets. And the second thing it means is that if you're sued personally, it's very hard for the creditor to reach in and seize your LLC assets because a lawsuit against you is separate from a lawsuit against the LLC. Let me give you a diagram. I, I, I know that might be hard to follow. Take a look at this diagram here. I don't know if you guys can see it very well. So this is you at the top, right? I like you guys at the top. I like you guys. So you're here at the top and you own two assets. You own an LLC. And then you own your own personal assets that are separate from the LLC. Say a checking or a savings account. 
Your LLC in this case owns a rental property. So there's two types of protection the LLC gives you. If your LLC incurs a debt, that debt is a debt of the LLC, which is separate from you. So it does not affect your personal assets. On the other hand, also, if you get sued, your debts are separate from the LLC's debts. So we'll talk about how it's difficult if you get sued for someone to reach in and seize your LLC assets because their ability to seize the LLC assets is restricted to what's called a charging order. A charging order, that's the fancy name for it in Texas. And let me explain to you how a charging order works. So let's use an example. Let's say you are a chef and you're very good, but for whatever reason, someone sues you for food poisoning. And then they say, okay, I know that you own a rental property in your LLC. I want to seize that rental property from you. I want to take it from you. You go, oh, I'm not interested in that. So the Texas Business Organizations Code, that's this TBOC right here, TBOC, Texas Business Organizations Code says, no, 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 that's not the way it works in Texas. Even though you've got a lawsuit against the person, your exclusive remedy the only thing you can do to try to get a hold of those LLC assets, that rental property, is you can get a charging order. And nice for us is that a charging order is very restrictive against the person who's trying to take your LLC assets from you. What does that mean? So here's some examples. Someone with a charging order against your LLC cannot force you to sell the rental property, cannot force you to say, you know what? I want to take your rental property from you. I want the cash. Cannot force you to sell it. The creditor with a charging order does not have access to the LLC's other assets. Let's say you have an LLC and it owns a rental property. That rental property has a check and there's a checking account too. The charging order that the creditor has cannot force you to take money out of that checking account and pay the money to the creditor. Can't force you to do that. And they also, the creditor with the charging order, cannot force you to say how to manage your LLC. You still control the business decisions in your LLC. You still get to decide, you know, who to sign the tenant for, what leases to sign, what payments to make, what expenses to pay. The only right that the person with the charging order has is the right to receive LLC distributions that you're entitled to receive, that you're entitled to receive. So wait a second, let me, I know that's a lot, so let me try to put that together for you guys. So someone sues you for food poisoning and they wanna reach your rental property in the LLC, okay? And you say, well, I don't want that to happen, right? It's my LLC, my rental property, I don't want you to have it. Texas agrees with you. So Texas is gonna say, hmm, he cannot force you to sell the rental property. He cannot force you to deed the rental property over to the creditor. But the only right he has is to say, well, if the LLC get, makes a distribution, then I can take the distribution. But I cannot control when the distributions are made because I can't vote the LLC interest. So the creditor is in a bind. It can sit there and wait to receive distributions because it has a charging order, but it cannot make those distributions happen because you still control the LLC. You're still the owning member and you still vote all the interest of the LLC. So that is a big reason why people don't like to sue are really dissuaded by LLCs because they know they can't make you withdraw money from the LLC. Okay. I know that's a bit abstract. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Okay, your client is the dude. The creditor gets a charging order of $20,000, $20,000 against the LLC interest of the dude. The dude's LLC has two assets. It's got $10,000 of cash and a rental property, a rental property. Assume for our case, 
you know, the landlord insurance just doesn't cover this kind of lawsuit. So there's no insurance coverage here. Okay, so let's put pedal to the metal, my friends. The creditor has a valid charging order, which is the exclusive remedy the creditor has in the state of Texas. Can the creditor reach the cash inside the LLC? Can the creditor seize the cash inside the LLC? What do you guys think? I know this is new, new for a lot of, it might be new for a lot of you. So I really wanna know what you guys think because this will be helpful to me to know if I'm teaching it very well. No, in this case, remember, they're trying to reach inside the LLC. So their only remedy is a charging order. A charging order does not allow the creditor to reach in and seize the assets from inside the LLC. So no, even though they've got a judgment for $20,000, a charging order for $20,000, and there's $10,000 of cash in the LLC, can the creditor reach the LLC cash? No, they can't. Uh, because their charging order remedy doesn't let them do that. Next question, can the creditor with a charging order force the sale of the rental property in the LLC? Can the creditor force the sale of the rental property that's in the LLC? What do you guys think? I see a no. Thank you for that answer. I really appreciate it. Any other answers? Any other thoughts? Well, whoever is on the Galaxy S8, you are exactly correct, right? Because the creditor's only remedy is the charging order. And the charging order only lets the creditor say, in the event that the LLC owner authorizes a distribution, I can take the distribution to satisfy my $20,000 judgment. But does that mean I can force the distribution? No. Does that mean I can force the withdrawal of cash from the LLC? No. Does that mean I can force the sale of the rental property that the LLC owns? No. So this is really good for the LLC owner, but bad for the creditor because the creditor may be looking at the assets and saying, I know that you can pay me. I know you have the ability to pay me, but I can't force you to pay me because you have a valid LLC. And my charging order, which is the exclusive remedy under the Texas Business Organizations Code says, I have to wait for distributions and there's no way for me to force distributions. So you kind of see from the creditor's point of view, an LLC is a really nasty device it really prevents them from trying to get at the LLC assets, which is why we like them for you guys. So now we are doing the second part, which is, okay, I told you the good stuff. I got to tell you guys the bad stuff now because I just talked about the charging order and it's very hard to reach into an LLC and just rip those assets out but there's always exceptions. So I want you guys to know about those exceptions so you're not surprised. And this will be very good for your friends who have LLCs too, because if you've got friends who have, have LLCs, it's really good for them to know this too. So you can really help your friends too. So what we just talked about, the general rule is that under the Texas Business Organizations Code, a charging order is the sole remedy you have to try to reach into an LLC and get those assets. Creditor has just got to sit there and say, well, if the LLC owner chooses to make a distribution, I can seize that distribution, but I can't force him to do that. If you are in the position of being the LLC manager and you know you've got a big charging order against you, <laughs> the last thing you're going to do is authorize a distribution. You're going to just say, well, you know what? I don't care. Uh, I don't have to make any distributions at all because I own 100% of this thing. I'm just going to pay myself a salary. And uh, the, the creditor with a charging order, um, well, he can wait forever. No problem. 
So as you can imagine, the person with the charging order is not very happy about this at all. So what else, what is he gonna do? You know, sometimes what he can do is, if you read about this on Google, it's really hard to follow because the law changed and I had to consult with uh, some litigation attorneys here at the firm, is what you'll read on the internet, and especially if you read about it in other states, but in Texas, it's called piercing the corporate veil. So the plaintiff is looking at the LLC and says, ah, you know, I don't want this charging order. This really doesn't do anything for me. I don't want to sit around and wait for distributions because that could take forever. How about I convince the judge that I can pierce the corporate veil and pretend the LLC doesn't exist? So that way I can just go in there and grab the cash in the LLC and force the sale of the rental property. Well, I don't know about you guys, but when I first learned about that, I really did not like that idea. So that sounds kind of abstract, it's kind of scary. Let me give you an example. Okay, so this is kind of a dense example, so let me walk you guys through it. I, I'm sorry if it's kind of small. In this example, the creditor is a building contractor and he gets a judgment against the LLC. He says, remember the LLC is liable for its own debts. So just assume for this case, the LLC went into a valid contract with a building contractor. Contractor is unhappy with the way the contract went out. And he says, you know what? I wanna sue you, Mr. LLC. And remember the LLC is a separate entity from you, right? They're separate things of the state of Texas. But then the building contractor looks at the assets of the LLC and he says, huh, you know, because you run the LLC a certain way, you say, I'm not gonna hold a lot of cash in my LLC. And this rental property has a mortgage on it. Like I deliberately did that. So the LLC assets, there's not a lot of assets in the LLC, but the creditor, he goes, oh, you have a large savings account, huh? Well, you know what? I'd rather not go through the trouble of trying to get the LLC assets because there's not a lot there. How about I try to seize your savings account? I want to get at your savings account. In this example right here, this middle box right here that I'm trying to show you guys, assume right here in this box that the rental insurance, the property insurance you have just doesn't cover this kind of claim. It's not covered for simplicity. So the creditor looks at the LLC assets and he says, I don't want the LLC assets because I know you've got a big personal savings account. I want that savings account. So what he's going to do is he's going to say, I want to pierce the corporate veil. I want to say, you know what? This LLC should be disregarded, ignore it, pretend it's not there. I want to go ahead and reach the personal owner's personal savings account. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about piercing the corporate veil. The LLC should keep the LLC debts and your debts separate. But what he's trying to do is breach the LLC and say, you know what? It's not there. I want to seize your personal assets. So that's why we're concerned about piercing the corporate veil and why I don't want it to happen to any of my clients. Uh, here's another example with reverse veil piercing. I will not, uh, we can cover that later. So, if you read the statutes in other states, they're all over the place because some states say you need A, B, C, and D to pierce the corporate veil. But some states say, mm, no, we'll just go with A. A is enough. Texas tries to come out and give us a lot of protection so that we can rely on our LLCs as being valid entities that shield, that separate our assets from the LLC assets. So the general rule is that if you own an LLC, you are not liable for the debts of the LLC because the LLC is a separate thing from you. Also, the general rule is that just because you fail to follow a few formalities of the LLC, just because you might have missed a few paperwork items or you didn't do proper meeting minutes one time, that by itself is not enough to allow the creditor to reach your personal assets. So you see here with these two rules right here together, the Texas Business Organizations Code is trying to make it really clear. 
none of this squirrely business that you might see in other jurisdictions. You just say, look, you can rely on your LLC. And just because you forgot to dot an I or a T somewhere does not mean that your personal assets are at risk. But there is a fraud rule. There is a fraud rule. So take a look at this. I'm sorry if it's kind of small. It says two things together. If a member uses an LLC to commit fraud against somebody, and that fraud primarily benefits the person committing the fraud, a judge may say, well, because we've got fraud and we're trying to, and the fraud is being persecuted by the person who's benefiting from the fraud, we may undo the LLC to the extent to reverse the fraud. So you go, oh my goodness, Chris, what does that mean? This sounds really nebulous. This sounds really open-ended. I do not like this uncertainty. I hear you. So let me give you, let's go through a little bit more guidance from the Texas Business Organizations Code. Remember, the general rule in Texas is that it says, look, if an LLC is valid. It separates your debts from the LLC's debts. What you really need to show to ignore the LLC is you got to show fraud. Fraud was committed by the LLC member, and we're only going to undo the LLC as it pertains to the person who benefited from the fraud. Okay, so you go, oh my goodness, Chris, that's really open-ended. How do the courts actually deal with this? So here, here is the bullet list that we want our clients to avoid. And tell your friends to avoid this stuff too with the LLC. Because remember, by default, Texas respects the form of the LLC. It says, if you've got a valid LLC, um, it's very hard to reach the assets in that LLC. And just because that LLC has a debt doesn't mean you personally own that debt. But here are the things that they look for in the cases to say, if we've got fraud and you've got these factors, these factors may be enough to indicate there is fraud. So it's on a case-by-case -case business, case-by-case uh, -case analysis, but here's the first factor. If you're not following the formalities of the LLC, that could be evidence of fraud. Are you doing undocumented transfers of money by the LLC to other people? You know, are you not running things through the LLC checking account? Are you not using the LLC cash for LLC cash business? LLC business purposes? Are you unable to explain what's going on inside the LLC? If you've got really bad situation with these things, these factors look really bad, that might be evidence of fraud, might be. It's a case-by-case -case basis. So you go, oh my goodness, Chris, you're making me sweat. What's going on? Give me an example. How does this work? I go, okay, we're friends here. I want to help. So let me give you a concrete example. Remember, by default, your LLC gives you asset protection. The debts of the LLC are not your debts, and it's very hard to reach into an LLC and seize the assets of the LLC. So we're talking about an exception here. So veil piercing example number one. Peter and Paul are co-members in an LLC. Co-members in an LLC. Paul has a separate struggling LLC. You know, it's not doing too well. Paul lies to Peter. Paul steals money from their joint LLC to shore up his failing LLC. Can Peter pierce the corporate veil and reach Paul's personal assets to undo the fraud that was committed against him because of the lies? Remember, in Texas, to do veil piercing against an LLC, you need fraud, and that you're undoing the veil against someone who personally benefited from that fraud. So I know this is a tough one for you guys. This might be the first time you've seen this sort of question. Under this fact pattern, where Paul lied to Peter and used the money to help his own failing LLC, can Peter sue Paul and say, wait a second, you committed fraud against me. I want to pierce the corporate veil and sue your personal assets to undo the fraud you committed against me. Can we pierce the corporate veil under this particular set of facts? What do you guys think?
I got a yes. Oh, Hunter, I like your answer. I like your answer. That's a very lawyerly. That's a very lawyerly. More particular facts could change my answer, but yes. Thank you guys for letting me know what you guys think. I was deliberately trying to shade the facts in this case to show fraud. Uh, that's why I highlighted lying and stealing and misappropriating money for a non-business purpose because it's okay to use the joint LLC's money for its for that LLC, but to use it to prop up someone else's LLC on the basis of a lie, I was trying to show fraud here, you guys. So in this case, I'm glad that you guys both said yes, because this fact pattern raises the issue of fraud. So if we've got fraud, you can ignore the protections of an LLC and try to undo that fraud. But you see here, the case, the case is pretty extreme, I think, to help you Hope you guys sleep at night if you guys have an LLC. We've got outright fraud and mis misappropriation of assets. Let's do an example number two. Leo is the member uh, and manager of an LLC with investors. Leo fabricates a business trip to Hawaii with non-LLC girlfriends. There is no business activity in Hawaii at all. Leo charges $300,000 to the LLC checking account and says, yeah, totally business purposes. Completely, all, I spent all the money for the LLC. Corporate investors find out about this and they were not happy about their $300,000 being used for non-business purposes. Can they sue Leo personally and pierce the corporate veil? Because Leo is going to say, well, it's an LLC business. You can't reach my assets. Does this, do these facts raise the issue of fraud so that they can pierce the corporate veil and seize Leo's assets personally for fraud? What do you guys think? I've got a yes. I've got another yes. Yeah, exactly. You guys, I, in this case, I was trying to shade the facts again to show fraud, right? because we've got lying, we've got misrepresentation, and we've got not using LLC money for LLC purposes. So I hope what these facts are showing is I hope they're showing that at least in Texas, to ignore an LLC, you've got to have pretty bad set of facts, pretty blatant lying. So the next issue is, if you're talking, if you're thinking about your own LLC or your friends and how to protect them from veil piercing, what we want to do is because it's a facts, uh, it's a particular facts and circumstances kind of case, case by case basis. Tilt all the fact, tilt all the factors in your favor. Try to respect all the corporate formalities of your business. Do the meeting minutes. Make sure that you're using LLC cash solely for LLC purposes. File all your franchise tax returns. When you're doing invoices, you know, if you use the LLC to pay for personal expenses, reimburse the LLC. Or if you've got, if you're sharing expenses between entities, leave a paper trail of, you know, the LLC is responsible for 40% of this bill. So the LLC is paying 40% of the bill or we're going to reimburse it so it works out to where it's paying 40% of the bill. Let me give you an example. So forgive me, you guys. I used to do accounting at my previous job, so I, I like these accounting examples. Ben goes to Hawaii, and he conducts some LLC business while there. No problem. Completely normal, right? You have a powwow, team building, where you say, you know what, let's go have a conference in Hawaii, and we're going to get some business done there. So if we want to document legitimate business purposes for spending on the LLC, how do we do that? How do we do that? Think of some, th some documents you would have or some emails you would have to show that if you're spending money in Hawaii, it's for legitimate business purposes. Do you got some ideas in mind? Got some ideas in mind? I'll give you some ideas. If you're trying to show that you're doing legitimate business activity in Hawaii, which you can't do, no question, 
it's good to leave a paper trail. So imagine the IRS is auditing you. I like to leave meeting minutes, right? An email to the file saying, oh, you know, here's who was, who was there. Here's what we talked about. Here are the decisions that we made. Make sure that if the LLC is paying for part of the trip, you know, make sure it's only paying for the business part of the trip. So it's 50% business, LLC should pay 50%. If you've got, an, what a lot of people do is they've got an LLC uh, credit card. So they got some business points on there. You know, if it's 50% business, but you charge the whole thing on that credit card, reimburse the LLC for 50%. And then, you know, tell the bookkeeper, shoot them an email and say, hey, you know, when you're doing the books for this month, here's how it all panned out. Here's why we paid, um, you know, $2,000 for the trip, but I put in $1,000 into the LLC checking account because I was reimbursing it for the 50% use. That's the kind of paper trail that's really helpful to show that, you know what, I am respecting the fact that the LLC is a separate entity for me because I don't want the veil pierced on my LLC at all, right? So I'm going to follow the formalities and prove that I'm doing everything correctly because I don't want the creditors reaching into my LLC and seizing those assets. You guys, thank you for holding on with me and being here with us. The next topic will be how a series LLC can hold multiple rentals to save you on filing fees, but give each rental property its own separate liability shield so that if one rental property gets sued, the other rental properties are protected and shielded from that lawsuit. Take a minute here, you guys. Take a little stretch, get a drink. I'll be back in 20 seconds. All right, you guys, welcome back. Okay, so new topic. Really glad to have you guys come through with the liability protection. Let's talk about series LLCs. So in Texas, you can have a regular LLC or a series LLC. So what we're talking about here is let's say that you've got more than one rental property. You've got three or four. Can I really reduce my paperwork requirements and have them all owned by a single LLC? But if one LLC triggers a lawsuit, I don't want that one, that one lawsuit on rental property number one to infect rental property two, three, or four. I want to keep them all shielded from each other. How can we do that? Well, with a series LLC, you can and then we'll also talk about how a plaintiff will try to attack a series LLC. So you know the pros and the cons and how to protect yourself. Okay, so remember general rule, if you own an LLC, you are not liable for the debts of the LLC. So even though the LLC may owe $10,000, that doesn't mean that debt flows upstream to you and you owe $10,000. So that's good, but wait a second. Even though the LLC's debt may not flow upstream to hit your personal assets, remember an LLC is still liable for its own debt. So if it enters a contract, its own liabilities, its own assets are subject to seizure. So let's do an example. An LLC owes $100,000 to somebody and owns five rental properties, all in the LLC's own name. Are all five of the rental properties exposed to seizure on the debt default? If that $100,000 comes due and the LLC can't pay that $100,000, can the creditor reach any of the five rental properties that are owned by the LLC? Why or yes or no and why? What do you guys think?
Yes, right? Because the LLC, yes, exactly. The LLC's property, the LLC for legal purposes, if it's a valid LLC, it's just like an individual. So if you get sued for $100,000 and you own five rental properties, the creditor can theoretically reach any of those five pieces of rental property. If the LLC owns five different pieces of rental property and is sued for $100,000, that creditor can reach any of those five rental properties. So that's not probably not a very happy result for you because you prefer that they only be able to reach one LLC at a time. So a series LLC is kind of a way to segregate the liabilities of each rental property from another. Let's do a diagram. Okay, so take a look at this diagram right here. It's a simplification. So you've got an LLC, the series LLC right here, and it's got series one, series two, and series three. So this would be your first rental property. This would be your second rental property. This would be your third rental property. The idea here is that a series LLC can create a bunch of little sub-series underneath this. In this case, series one, series two, series three. And each series can own a separate rental property. In this case, property A, property B, and property C. And look at what the Texas Business Organization Code says. The debts of one series are not enforceable against the other series if it, uh, I, that's an important if, if the assets of each series are reasonably identifiable, reasonably identifiable. So if I, leave, I create a series LLC and I create a paper trail that I've got a series one, a series two, and a series three. And there's a very good paper trail that says series one owns property A, series two owns property B, and series three owns property C. If for some reason property A generates a lawsuit, but I properly documented that property A belongs to series one, the assets in series two and the assets in series three are not exposed to the lawsuit in series one. They are in separate airtight containers as long as I've got my paperwork set up properly. So that's really nice because setting up separate LLCs for each separate rental property you have, you know, that's a separate $300 filing fee for each LLC. And then, you know, you've got to pay the, I know this hurts my soul as the attorney who gets paid to do this, but you know, you've got to draft, you pay the attorney to draft a new company agreement for each separate LLC. So that's kind of expensive. What if I just do a series LLC and I just want to add a new series? So I've got, I pay for this general series LLC right here, this mother LLC. And then I say, you know what, Chris, I've got three rental properties, but I want this one LLC to own all three of them. But I want to have a separate liability shield between property A, property B, and property C. Well, if I've got a series LLC, that's pretty straightforward. All I've got to do is get a certificate of designation, maybe two or three pages, and do a, a DBA assumed name doing business as for each separate series. I've got that paperwork, which doesn't require an additional $300 filing fee. It doesn't require a completely new company agreement, just a new filing for an assumed name, two page certificate of designation. I've got the paperwork set up and now if property A generates a lawsuit, property B and property C, because we've clearly cordoned them off, we've clearly shown that they're in a separate series, property A's liabilities cannot affect property B or property C. And we did that, we saved $600 in filing fees. And you know it just depends on how much your attorney costs to do the company agreements. So you could have saved a lot of money by using a series LLC and reduce the amount of paperwork you've got in your file. So that's how a series LLC really helps because it really helps on the filing fees and the administrative costs. 
Let's do an example. So Jack deeds five different rental properties into a valid Texas series LLC. But Jack does not create the records that document that there is a separate series five, four, three, two, one. The series LLC is sued because of something that happened at rental property one. Can the plaintiff try to seize rental property number five? So recap, we got a series LLC, but Jack did not create the records to show that each rental property is in a separate subseries. He did not create that paper trail. So there's a lawsuit on rental property number one. The plaintiff wins. Can the plaintiff seize rental property number five? What do you guys think? What do you guys think? I've got a yes. I've got another yes. Exactly. You guys are exactly right. I'm really glad to see your answers. The answer is you have no series protection here because of this second bullet here. Jack did not create the records documenting that they're a separate series. So rental property one is not separate from property two or three, or four, or five. So I wanted to show there's a good things about series LLCs, but you've got to do the paperwork to make sure each rental property is separate. Otherwise, it's no good. And I asked this question right here at the bottom. Can you make the series records showing that each property is separate after the fact of the lawsuit? And I asked that tongue-in-cheek because the answer is probably not. So I never want you guys to be in this situation where you've got a series LLC, but there is a question, there's a question about whether or not each of the rental properties in its, is in its own separate series, right? I never want you guys to be in that situation. So here's kind of the ways to prove when you have a series LLC, each particular rental property is in its own separate series so that if rental property number one is subject to a lawsuit, it does not infect the other rental properties. They are protected. They're shielded off. So first thing you can do, certificate of designation to document that there are separate series and each rental property is in its own separate series. My friends, that's the bare minimum. You gotta have that. You really need to have that. What about if I get a separate tax ID number, EIN, for each series LLC's rental property? That's not technically required by the Texas Business Organizations Code, but it's a we really like that idea because that causes your CPA to generate records in the tax records for the filings for the LLC to show oh, you know, I've got rental property number one, it's got its own tax ID number. I got rental property number two, and it's got its own separate tax ID number. And rental property number three has got its own separate tax ID number. It's a little bit of a hassle to get it set up, but once you've got it set up and automated with your CPA, it should run automatically, as long as you, you've got a good QuickBooks system for them, right? Or you hire a good bookkeeper. But that helps create the paper trail in the lawsuit that says, hey, even if I get sued on rental property number one, rental two, three, four, and five are separate. We like to have a separate checking account for each series LLC as well. It's not required by the code, but that's additional paperwork. And then the last thing, this, this makes us feel really good as attorneys, we like to see this, is if you email us an, a spreadsheet indicating which rentals belong to which series, because then we can produce that in a lawsuit, right? We can say, oh, you know, we didn't create this paper trail after the fact, after we got sued. We didn't just manufacture it. We, ha we have a regular practice, a regular practice of documenting that this rental is in series one, this rental in series two, this rental in series three. You know, I don't want you guys to be in this horror situation where you call and you've got all the rental properties in the LLC, but there's no proof that they're separate. 
There's no proof that they're separate. And you were sued yesterday when you called us. Don't want you guys or your friends or the people you care about to be in that situation. Your strongest defense with a series LLC is when you get sued and they try to say there's no series separation. Uh, you just tell the plaintiff, hey, here's this box full of documentation. Um, I got three boxes, 400 pages. Have fun with that. So we definitely want you guys to have that separation, proof of separation in your series LLC. So I'm seeing us at 726 on my clock and I'm really happy to have had you guys for our presentation.